Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 126 of Storyteller Conclave. This is a show all about helping you run the best tabletop role-playing game that you can, whether you're a new storyteller or dungeon master learning the craft, or an experienced storyteller looking to take your game to the next level. I'm Sarah. And I'm Rob. How are we doing, Rob? You know, I, I, I know our show today is about uh, character concepts. Yeah. And uh, I was literally just trying to find the original list uh, of 20 questions. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Because uh, I realized I did not have it up, and I wanted to have it up just so I could reference it. And then I went, how many versions of 20 questions are out there? And there's a lot. Oh, yeah. Now, it's it's. It, I just saw one where it said the ultimate 367 question list That's for your character. Too many that questions. is way too many questions. That is way too many. So, hey, everybody. Hi. Welcome to Wednesday night. Yeah. Oh, um, Wednesday night therapy session with yeah. Storyteller Conclave. Yeah. So, um, we didn't have any shows recently. Um, I think the only thing lately has been uh, the amount of time we've been trying to devote to a new game. Uh, uh, yeah. New World. If you, oh, if two, you have two, it. Two new games, honestly. Uh, truth. Because uh, the the Valheim Hearth and Home update came out, and we just drowned in that until For a whip. until the moment New World came out, then and we then, drowned in that, and then just Valheim Valheim who? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I knew that person once. Yeah, uh, but no, New World is interesting. I'll flat it's pretty, out say it's, it's interesting. It's pretty cool. It's um, uh, I I like I like the UI. I like the outdoorsy sort of survivally sort of aspect to it. Um, it's not always survivally, but like I don't know, you know what I mean, like chopping and chopping wood and mining you know i I will say going off road is the best experience in there the grind that they put in it is pretty and fun enough that it doesn't necessarily just feel like a grind yeah and i I, and i think that's that's a fun aspect even with everybody buried in there just grinding away to try and get up to levels Mm -hmm. and do things um but i i hope as time goes out like lays out a little bit more we, we can develop more of a story in it because the the opening story mm-hmm. um is exceptionally straightforward. Yeah. It really yeah. doesn't give you much time as the silent protagonist to develop a character or a, even a feel, even I would say uh, 2% into the story. Yeah, yeah. Like I I don't know where I am in the story itself, but I will say that the one thing that all MMOs tend to do and I I say tend to cuz not all do this mm-hmm. um is not let you really develop as a character. Whereas with like games like SWOTOR, um, Star Wars, uh, um, Star Wars, Field Republic, um, you kind of did develop a character and, and, and a feeling, even though you were boxed into certain um, preset answers and such, it still fit a lot closer to the standard Bioware. I'm going to give you some choice and let you have feeling. Yeah. SWOTOR was really Kind of like Knights of the Old Republic with with uh or, or uh, what was the game I'm thinking of? Was it Knights of the Old Republic? Could have been. Uh, the anyway, so but it was it was kind of like um one of your standard Bioware games with yeah. friends. It was it was less I think less an MMO and more of more of a single player game that you got to play in a shared space with other people. Is what yeah. it felt like a lot. Yeah, I I definitely would go with that. You you you, you never felt like the people who were with you were any more than just extras. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's only been a few times in games where I felt like the other people actually add to the story or give it, uh, alterations or changes. Um, but I will say that based upon the companions that you do have, it did add flavor to the story and I always liked that. Yeah, sure. So. Sure. Absolutely. Um, so and kind of, kind of speaking of character concepts, you want to roll into that right away? Yeah. yeah. Briefly mention that, uh, I've got my game coming up again this Saturday. And you do. Two week, two week turnaround time was really tight for me. And that was pretty damn tight. Yeah. Uh, so it, if you guys got to get into combat, it may not be the prettiest thing because I don't have any of my painting or crafting projects done, but, uh, yes. Uh, but I, I, I don't, I don't think there's going to be a lot of combat. I think, I think this next session is going to be a lot more of a mystery okay. uh, than anything else. I think there's going to be a lot of social. Hmm. Um, and I am, uh, I'm very, very prepared for it. Gotcha. Very prepared for that. And uh, I'm finding, especially, and I think I said this last last, uh, um, last episode, is that what I'm finding is my game prep with Savage Worlds has to be a lot more fluid. Mm-hmm. And that's not something I'm used to. I'm gotcha. used to really hard planning a session. Mm-hmm. And you know, obviously, you you leave you leave a couple avenues open, sure. you know, stuff like that. It's, it's never a railroad or anything like that. But it's, 
I, I have a lot firmer idea of what you guys are going to do, especially if it involved combat with D&D, because mm-hmm. then it was going to be like, well, that's half the session right there. Right, right. Or that's three quarters of the session, depending on how big the combat was, you know? Right. Um, and with Seth Worlds, I have no clue. I have no clue what you guys are going to do, and I have to kind of be prepared for everything. Um, there was an NPC introduced last game that I had no, like... <laughs> No idea was going to be introduced because your character was like, I would like to meet the cultists first. Yeah. And I was like, uh, yeah, sure. We can get you in touch sure. with them. Yeah. Sure. You rolled high enough uh, yeah. that we'll make that happen. Oh, crap. Oh, crap. Oh, crap, yep. guys. I have to... okay, uh, yeah, sure. Here uh, here she is. Yeah. And and now, like, I'm like, okay, I just yes and did a cult. Now I have to write a cult. And yeah. I have, like, a week to do it. So, yeah. <laughs> so less of a light bulb. And more of a beacon, yeah, yeah. 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 So that, that's gonna it's, it's gonna turn out great. It's gonna turn out great. And for those of you who are uh, who are who are um, uh, Skyrim fans, this is going to be Meridia's beacon plot. My take on it, and it's gonna be great. Yeah, my character picked it up like an idiot. <laughs> no, you didn't fun. know what the hell it no, was. I... I was like, it's a it's a big rock shaped like a, like a grapefruit with like weird facets cut in it. And you're like, okay, sure. I grabbed a new hand touches the beacon. Oh, no, oh, Jesus crap. <laughs> He's like, I almost pitched it back out almost, the, into it was the like, woods. Rob almost pitched it back in the woods, whereas my character would be like, ah, oh, interesting. Let me put that in a bag. <laughs> 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 nice. Nice. Yeah, Sh- Sean, Sean just posts this gif in the, uh, the the live chat of this cat just ducking out and goes, yep, I'm out. chat. <laughs> I'm out. So, getting to character concepts. Um, so, I kind of alluded to this in, um, in our actual text for, the, uh, for this uh, show, is that... A lot of times we come up to games and we're interested in the story and we're interested in what the storyteller's going to do or maybe even the system or maybe a bit of the setting um, and we're like, yeah, 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 this is a great idea. And then we get ready to do the table and we're like, I don't, I don't know what, Mm -hmm. and, and suddenly we're stonewalling ourselves. And this is here to kind of give you, for the people who don't instantaneously have inspiration or or who need a little guidance or maybe you're not sure about your characters and where they could go this this is the 101 class this is this is we're going to talk about where they come from where ideas can sprout from where you can get some inspiration from and i'm not going to say the rules they're more of guidelines <laughs> <laughs> cuz there really there aren't many rules but there are definitely things you should watch out for um as a player and and that we have definitely seen as storytellers over the years yeah sure um and we're going to be loose with this. In fact, we're probably going to end up going over because I had an idea before the show of mm-hmm. uh, what I wanted to do. So we're we're going to do some on the fly character creation as well. Yeah, you're going to kind of get to hear uh, our our thought process out loud as we literally come up with surprise characters for settings that neither of us knows. Correct. Like literally, like we were literally talking about the show. Like, hey, you got to come up with a setting, and I've got to come up with a setting so that we can challenge each other with characters. Yeah. Those. Don't don't tell each other so nope. we can't prep ahead of time. So nope. it's all all has to be live. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So I, I have a rough idea of what the setting I'm going to p- pitch to Sarah is, and we'll we'll go from there. Yeah, I, I got I got a bit of a bit of a framework. So when I'm thinking of characters, um, a lot of times I will actually just have pre-existing ideas written down mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. i've got a couple of journals where i've written different things just mostly footnotes and stuff either characters from movies um or books that i've read or um a lot of times songs song lyrics will make characters for me yeah, yeah. I, I find songs really work well for me because i can listen to them over and over and they're short enough that it helps remind me why and what the drive of this character originally was. Well, the other, the other great thing about about music as a as an inspiration source like that is that it, it carries a lot of emotional weight. Yes, because you know it's it's got an accompaniment outside of just the words mm-hmm. being there, mm-hmm. and so you can kind of get in the mood of a character. Yeah, along with it. Um. Yeah, it's uh one of the songs that uh I had actually written one song in here, but I I totally thought of another one literally as you were saying that uh that I've I've thought about having a character for is um uh the long way home. Uh, I oh jeez um now you're gonna make me do this because I always get it wrong uh because it's uh it's gonna come back to me let me let me think about this for a second because I'm terrible with band names uh the only the only the only long way home I know of is by the monkeys no 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 it'll it'll, it'll keep going keep going it'll, off, it'll come to the me. album pool it oh god I'm old um super tramp super tramp does it 
Lonely, okay. Lonely days turn to lonely nights. Uh, take a trip to the city lights and take the long way home. Oh, okay. I mean, maybe, and it's, I'll probably know. I probably know it if I heard yeah. it, but I'm not. And yeah. the the whole song is literally about, um, about just like you'd missed out on something in your life, and uh, maybe it's time to try something different just for a little while. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, you, you you've gotten stuck in the 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 mum you know mum bum of life where you're just doing the same thing over and over again why not try a little something different and it's things like that because you can always come back to those songs and get the same feeling like you were saying mm-hmm. um and also uh get a feel and a reminder of of where you started with the character yeah sure and and sure. how much you're you're changing uh, so for for me, I mean, like uh, a lot of times, especially you know with the, with the prevalence of Dungeons and Dragons in the uh, the tabletop community, um, oftentimes your starting point is uh, not as ephemeral as that. But you get a uh, like you're told make a cleric or make a fighter, right? You know, um, and I mean, yeah, those are those are definitely uh, concepts for you. Uh, on one hand, you're kind of pigeonholed into into a concept. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, though. Um, it can be a really great thing to fight analysis paralysis to have a starting point as explicit as your character is a fighter right or your character is a druid right you know because then you only need to figure out what flavor of druid that you're trying to come up with you know or sure. what flavor of of fighter you know mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um so those are those are those are often a fight a starting point for mm-hmm, us but definitely. sometimes sometimes we don't have an instruction of right. make this particular class yep um uh, I think setting specific characters are one of the best things to come up with. Oh God, yeah. Um, like people, because especially as, like, as a storyteller, man. Like if if I walked in and said I am okay, I'm I'm running an Elder Scrolls game, mm-hmm. you know, and someone was like, Oh hell yeah, I'm playing a Vine Dusk Ranger. I like I would shed tears of joy hearing that come out of a player's mouth. Because first off, you have a clear concept of what you want your character to yep. be. But second off, you know the setting well enough to know what a Vine Dusk Ranger is. Yeah. And are enthusiastic about playing one. Yep. You know? Yep. Like, oh, yes, that is a gift. Mm-hmm. So, and I'm sure, I'm sure plenty of other storytellers feel that way. You oh, know? God, yeah. I mean, there is some, like, I would have to say you get some of the opposite of that. Mm-hmm. Like, if I'm playing a and d game in Forgotten Realms... But I'm not a master of Forgotten Realms, and someone's like, "Oh, I'm gonna play an Archmaid Red, red you know, Red Wizard, um, who is, uh, you know, uh, an apprentice under, you know, this cult group," and it's mm-hmm. like, "Oh, uh, okay, I'm, I mean, that sounds cool." You said a lot of words. Some of them had to do with Forgotten Realms, but I'm not sure how any of that goes Correct. together in the setting. Yeah, right. And and I say as a storyteller. <clears throat> You got to do a little bit of research, but realistically, it's up to you how that fits. Well, no, like, and 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 even still, though, like, again, if a player said to me, "I want to play a red wizard," okay, your red wizard, as I understand, as I understand the red wizards, they're not great people, uh, and so probably not in this campaign. But you at least have a starting point, mm-hmm. and you at least know the setting well enough to know the words "red wizard" go together in yep. this setting. Yep. Okay. Cool. We can work with that. Yep. You want to play an archmage of some sort, may I direct you to one of the other, like, three or four arcane institutions mm-hmm. that maybe you could be a member of one of them, and your character concept won't have to change much. Right. You know? Um, and so I think that's still a really great starting point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. You know, if you're going to play Wheel of Time and someone wants to play an Aes Sedai or an Aiel or, yep. you know, something like that, a great. Sure. Absolutely great. Um, one of my favorite things is tropes. Tropes. I am a big fan of just picking a trope I want to play and going with that and trying to build a character around it. Fair enough. Um, so what I'm talking about, for instance, is like, okay. Uh, Go to tropes.com to start with if you yeah. really need a start point. Uh, t- TV tropes. TV tropes is great. Yeah, TV tropes. Um, so uh, something like, you know, two sisters. One is tall, quiet, and strong. The other one is small, mouthy, and scrappy. Yep. You see that in cartoons all the time. You yep. see, like, it's, you know, mm-hmm. and those are two of my favorite NPCs I've ever created. Yep. Um, or, you know, how about the savant character who yep. appears completely inept and foolish, but is an unmatched master in precisely one thing. Yep. Uh, think monk, 
Monk is a great example. Monk is a great example of this. Yep. Yep. There, there's there been a number of those. Uh, the Good Doctor was another one, uh, another great story. He was a master surgeon and yet had all kinds of social anxieties oh, and yeah. was yeah, yeah. had issues. Um, so, yeah, definitely that. Um, you know, uh, was it the... Um, the aspiring warrior, mm-hmm. the, you know, I, I am not yet a warrior, but I have everything that I need to be one, you know, uh, type of trope. So sure, you've got the, sure. you know, the young samurai, the, you know, the, you know, I, I, I want to be a Jedi. I want to be a samurai. Mm-hmm. I'm always looking for a master and, you know, you're finding that edge and like, I, I can do this, you know, almost the level of like fangirling over, exactly. you know, like, oh my God, you're a real warrior. Like mm-hmm. I can, you know, can I be like you? Can I learn from you? Yep. This yep. is my destiny. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, or you know, like we talked about in episode one hundred eight. Yep. Um, about uh, exploring aspects of yourself. Maybe the starting point for your character is I don't know anything else about this character, but I I have been questioning my gender identity, and I want to try a new gender identity on. Yep. Maybe this character is a woman for me, or maybe this character is a man, or maybe this character is non-binary or something like that. Yep. Uh, maybe this character has a different sexuality than I currently present as. Yep. Um, maybe this character, I have, I personally have a lot of social anxiety. Maybe this character is brave and outgoing. So I can try being brave and outgoing mm-hmm. in a gamified setting without, yep. you know, and taking those aspects of yourself and putting them into the thing. You might not know anything else about the character, but at least you've got that starting kernel of like, this is a bold and outgoing character. Now, who could I make that's a bold and outgoing character in this setting? And a lot of people who who play a lot, like I would say, um, like myself or you, where we've played in a lot of different games, maybe even reversing one of our normal habits. Like, I tend to force myself to become a leader in groups. And it's really hard for me to not do that because i it's just something I naturally gravitate to. Mm-hmm. So playing a character that I'm trying to pull away from that becomes a challenge to me. And I have to rethink my reactions to things. I have to rethink how I'm going to adapt so that I don't just push myself into those positions. Mm -hmm. I maybe push somebody else into them, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, And, and create a a, a distaste for it just so I can try something different to challenge myself. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I've definitely done the Ultra. I've, I've, I've had a character and I love, I have a couple characters that I absolutely love who are totally not me, Mm -hmm. but there are aspects of me that like under another setting, I might've wanted to explore. Sure. You know? Sure. Um, I love stories that have, uh, that allow people to, to be those types of things. I know a guy who was playing, uh, who, or I should say I read about a guy and asked him questions about it, um, where he played a chef who was a healer. Mm-hmm. They wanted a cleric. And he's like, great, my character's a chef. Mm-hmm. And they're like, what? He's like, he's a chef. So what God does he follow? I don't know. And they're like, what? He's like, he's an atheist. So how is he a cleric? Well, <laughs> he's still a healer. That's what you asked for. And so he he leaned into hearth healing, that basically he was a, a witch, mm-hmm. but never knew it, hmm. that his meals really did heal people, that yeah, his, yeah, yeah. his broth was wonderful. The secret ingredient was love. The whole time. Uh-huh. And he was just this big, silent, teddy bear chef who took care of the group and hated hurting people. Mm-hmm. And that that's how he decided to play his character because he always wanted to be a chef because he could burn water right, right, <laughs> personally. Right. Like, but he, he would come up with meals, he would come up with ideas and he just would integrate it. Oh huh. yeah. I actually want to want to address something uh, that, that actually just, just kind of came up in the, uh, okay. the live chat here. Sure. Uh, Knox in the box says, uh, ju- he says, just know that as a gay man, if you're playing as a uh, quote, playing as a gay man and you're not, my eye is falling on you in judgment. I'm watching for your BS. The idea doesn't sit well with me. Hmm. Um, and I want to kind of kind of, kind of address that um, sure. from uh, one member of the LGBT community to the other, um, and I I, I I understand that reaction. Mm-hmm. Um, however, I'm what I I want to caution you against making assumptions about other people's identities, because up until the point I came out as trans, mm-hmm. people assumed I was a straight dude. Yep, and. I'm not going to say that, you know, my coming out blew the socks off a lot of people and stuff like that. Some people just kind of cocked their head to the side and went, 
Okay, no, that actually adds up. Sure. Um, but uh, if you saw me playing a female character or playing a you know a, a gay character or something like that, um, and you you made the assumption that I that I was cisgender or that I was straight, um, I, I would caution you against judging others for that. Because you may not know the other person is closeted, mm-hmm. and that can be uh, dead honest. You can shove a person right back into the closet by being by by not 100%. being a welcoming member at the table. One hundred percent. So I I mean I I would like I said I I do understand the reaction and trust me look I I'm I'm the angry gay too, you know uh, I I I absolutely have lost a lot of patience for people but. I think, you know, just just to be responsible at the table, um, take a deep breath, and if someone is being, I think you can tell the difference between someone being just wantonly disrespectful and being a caricature of a gay person versus someone who is legitimately trying to portray something that they may or may not be, you know? Yes. I think there, there's, 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 and, and if, if they are acting in good faith, outside of their own what you were or, or should say what you presume to be their own realm of knowledge mm-hmm. and experience um i would say probably your best move is to like try to have a conversation with that person because to me like a person trying to play a gay character at the at the table is me and they're, and they're doing it in good faith I, I i almost feel like that's an olive branch correct you know and if they're going to try to share that experience at the table I would feel a little more welcome to share my own personal experiences with them to help kind of round out their character. Maybe have a conversation about it. Well, and I think the other part of it that gets me is um, I, I'm not just even going to focus on the fact of I, 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 I'm going to sidestep the, mm-hmm. the, 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 the gay aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm going to insert other things that, that are easy to hit. Let me just, I'm, I'm sorry, I want to interrupt with one final thought on my end. And okay, that is, and that is, Knox, this is not a call out. I'm not like trying to be like, hey, yes. you're, you're totally wrong and we're going to tell the public about it because I, this is a good, the reason I, I, I brought up your comment is because I think it's a very good, um, a very good addition to the discussion on character concepts when we're talking about playing someone who isn't you, when we're talking about playing something that is out of the, uh, a little bit Correct. out of the box for you. And I thought your comment was very good because it sparks this discussion. Yes. And I that's, agree. and that's all. So uh, like I said, and, and I, and I absolutely understand where you're coming from. So please don't take any of what I just said as an attack of any kind. No, no. And I, I think it is something to put a little light on with this, which I, I, I guess we never really thought about when we were doing the story uh, as much, um, or doing, writing this up, but, um, I think the same goes in a lot of other directions as well. I know um, that there have, and I have read about it, where people who are playing fighters who have been in war Mm -hmm. and are role-playing PTSD are offending, are are, are quote-unquote being offensive to people at the table who maybe actually have it and they're unaware of it. Yeah, Um, yeah. I was uh, was watching a stream, and one of the characters in the the role-playing group uh, was playing a character who uh, was um, uh, exhibiting signs of PTSD mm-hmm, about mm-hmm. Um, a, a, about magic in general. That basically, um, when they were because magic is rare in the game that they're playing, and when uh, so basically someone threw a fireball from their own group, uh, the fighter basically freaked out, had shell shock, and uh, took a took their own point of um, what did they do? The paralysis. Mm-hmm. They said, I have a condition of paralysis. Mm-hmm. And they were, the GM was like, what do you mean? And, like, uh, and he passed him a note and he goes, okay, you currently are paralyzed. Mm-hmm. And everybody at the table was kind of questioning it. But the comments in the stream afterward was because the character went on. He talked about, you know, the last time he had he was involved in magic um, was a, an explosion that killed a bunch of his, you know, a bunch of the other guards that were working with him. Mm-hmm. And he's just never accepted it. And he saw it all over again. And people were tearing into him a little bit about like, well, you don't understand it doesn't, you know, work like that, and you know, you can't just play around with PTSD. Mm-hmm. To which he said, "That's exactly how it works for me when I see a dog." And they were like, "What?" And he's just like, "I watched someone lose their arm to a dog mm-hmm. in front of me, so I understand PTSD very well." 
Yeah. I yeah. just decided to try and handle it differently in my story. Please don't tear yep. me up. Exactly. And it was kind of a turnaround uh, of that same thing. So when someone chooses to play an aspect of something, let them enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Let them explore it. Give them levity. If it's something that you X card because it's hurting you, take a moment to talk about it either after the game or with them or with the storyteller. Yeah. yeah because you no. don't know where the concept came from. Exactly. You don't know where that scene came from. Exactly. And and players can play through a lot of things. That's role playing does that for mm -hmm. us. So that's my side of that is is that it can mean a lot more than something that's that's personal or that you feel that the person's not doing a very good job of. As storytellers, I have to play a whole plethora of characters and at times I will play characters that are completely outside of me. I have to play women, I have to play men, I have to play lovers, I have to play enemies, I have to play all of these things. Yeah, I was going to say yeah, especially as a storyteller when you're when you're flipping through NPCs, like any NPC that has to come up there and especially right. if you want to give us any sort of an inclusive experience at the table, you know, and make it so that ever not everybody we run into is a straight white man, you know, obviously you've got to go outside of your own experience. Yeah. So, so good pause point. Thank yeah. you, Knox, for bringing up such a, 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 a important piece that we kind of didn't include in here. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. But, uh, yeah, exploration can be dangerous to a degree if you, uh, with, when we're not saying don't explore at the table, but definitely, uh, be aware of the people who might be. And in whatever you do, obviously, do it in good faith. Always. Always do Always. it in good faith. Always. So um so the one the one last like character generation thing that we didn't we didn't uh talk about is you mentioned well you, I mentioned you briefly the mentioned the surveys earlier. Yeah. But uh so there there are um like character surveys of just like who is your character, who was their parent, who was your daddy, what does he do? Yeah. Um uh, where are they from? Why did they get into adventuring, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and those can be very good for just kind of giving you, like, a starting point to kind of ask the, the right questions mm -hmm. to get your character fleshed out, or at least getting you thinking about who your character is and why they're there. Exactly. Um, I, I, I think the 20 questions surveys are better for starting the conversation than they are about being the conversation. I've often found the 20 questions are good after a a very basic concept starts. Yes. Like I'm a fighter. I'm an angry fighter. Okay. Let's let's hit some questions see mm -hmm. if we can get round this out a bit more. That's where I usually find those coming in and and things slide a lot once the questions start. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but there are definitely creators if you will mm -hmm. um where you don't necessarily i mean you can go online and find a character concept that's no big deal sure. that's a that's a random button away yeah 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 um but like seventh c has the tarot spread uh -huh. uh, right in the game that t basically outlines your history what your drive is and what you're moving forward to mm -hmm. which is fantastic i mean that's that's everything you ever wanted uh we did a system spotlight not too long ago on through the breach the uh, uh malifo setting by weird yes. games um, and that one's also got another tarot spread. Now yep. that one more is more like de designating your um, uh, your stats and stuff like that. But it does designate things like your origin, yes, um, and where you are in society currently, mm -hmm. and such like that. So, uh, you know, in a street urchin turned gunslinger mm -hmm. might be your might be your character concept right yeah. there, and that's at least. It doesn't tell you anything about how your character acts or what their values are and mm -hmm. that, but it at least gives you that starting point to think about, like, what does a street urchin turned gunslinger look like? What would, how would that play out? What would they value? You know? Yeah. And I, I like that. Um, I think Dungeon World kind of added on to that because um, it actually bonds you to the other people at the table, which I love that concept. Yeah, yeah. I love that you're literally tying your your respect your trust your your what you may owe what mm -hmm. you may be owed um and your backstory to other people at the table i'm pretty sure fate um i'm pretty sure that the core fate rules do this if if very at very least the dresden files rules yes um do this uh, also where part of your character concept is looking at the other group people in the group and saying uh what adventures have we been on in the past? Yeah. And what and what happened there? Yeah. And what experience did we draw from it? Right, right. So, and there's nothing to say that you couldn't incorporate those types of things 
into other systems. Sure. I sure. I I honestly think you could easily like if I'm making a D and D character, there's nothing that says I couldn't grab the Seven Seas book and do a tarot roll out and then adapt that mm-hmm. without a problem, or or grab uh, fate rules for bonds for characters and and uh, and throw that into my Savage World game. Sure, sure. Nothing. No, oh, Traveler does that too. Traveler with does the, that. Yep. With the, with, the, with the bonds growing up. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you, actually, uh, Traveler goes a little deeper than that. You actually have to survive your your backstory. That's true. Yep. <laughs> and then we died we, during character creation. Back to paranoia. Yeah. Everything leads back to paranoia. <laughs> uh, I don't think you can die during character creation. Paranoia. Can you? I think you can. I think you can. Huh. Base paranoia rolls can kill you. Oh man, that game. Yep. Yep. Um. So what about uh, what about like copying from from media? Because we talked about being being inspired by books and TV and stuff like that. But sometimes when you're kind of trying to come up with a character concept, mm-hmm. especially when you're newer to tabletop RPGs, you look at a character and you're like, "That's the that's the dude I want to play." Right? Is that okay? I'm gonna say yes, but yes, but okay. Because I've done it myself. Mm-hmm. I have definitely, as a storyteller, stolen character concepts, sure, almost whole cloth sure. out of out of worlds. But that's the whole thing: is it's out of the world. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not including them anymore. I may even be changing some of their backstory a little bit, uh, but I'm keeping their drive. Or I might be uh, taking their quirks and their tone and their demeanor. Um, but their nature of who they really are is completely something different whatsoever. Hmm. Um, I've done that a number of times with different characters. My current character is, uh, in your game, is effectively Sean Connery from The Name of the Rose. He is a educated, um, willing acceptor that uh, he's part of a clergy, but he is old and knowledgeable and has been around the block a few times. Mm-hmm. Um, so he knows... He knows to use his mouth before his fist. Yep. Um, and he he knows that everyone can be a friend at some level. Mm-hmm. You know, you may not be friendly, or you may not be friends, but you may be friendly. Yes. And courtesy gets you a lot further than a cut. You catch a lot more flies with honey than with vinegar. Correct. Yes. Correct. And and it can make a difference. And so I I. I lean on that, but he still has that gut, hard, moral value inside of him Mm -hmm. and a fiber that is constantly being twisted against the truth of what his back life was like, what his, what his, what his upbringing was really truthfully about. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I think that's probably the most important thing is, is trying to make it unique, trying to make it your own. Um, I don't know that I've ever like lifted anything whole cloth. (sighs) I mean, I I can definitely point to, like, hard inspirations for things, Mm -hmm. but, like, I don't think any of my characters have ever been, like, photocopied out of a piece of media. Um, I'd say probably the closest I've I've actually come is uh, Ravana in uh, my, my wizard in your game. Okay, where did you, where, where did you steal her from? Uh, well, <laughs> um, so there's this game called Myth: The Fallen Lords by okay. Bungie Software. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one of the Fallen Lords was a was a, a, a wizard by the name of Shiver. Mm-hmm. See where this is going. I can see where this is going. Uh, her actual name, I, I, I actually misheard. I thought it was Ravana, but it is actually Ravena or something like that. That's fine. But it's it's very close, and mm-hmm. she um. Uh, she was one of my. Uh, she was a bit, a bit of a more of a bit character, mm-hmm. but I liked her interaction with my favorite character in there, the Deceiver. Mm-hmm. And uh, so when I was coming up with the character concept, I was like, you know what? I've always really liked Ice Magic, mm-hmm. Shiver, Ravana. Let's sure. do this. You know, yeah. I uh, I almost whole cloth stole Roderick, um, who was uh, a character. He's your fop, right? He's my fop character. Yeah. Um, I threw him into uh um I've thrown him into a couple different games in the past, but my main game that I threw him in was um uh Seventh C second edition that I was playing. Um and he's just a socialite mm-hmm. who loves everyone and everything. So where'd you steal him from? Um I stole him from um oh god, now you you made me forget it completely. Um ha, 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 ha. behold my power. Yeah. Um Plunkett McLean. A a little known it's very seventh C movie, uh, that had uh, oh god, uh, the lead from Hackers, um, oh, Johnny Lee Miller, yeah, Johnny Lee Miller as the lead, okay, uh, in it, 
uh, who plays basically a uh, English. Uh, uh, it's 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 technically a French movie, um, but uh, he is a captain uh, who has you know by name more than anything else, mm-hmm. uh, who gets thrown in jail because uh, he's a he's he's a terrible gambler. Mm-hmm. Uh, next to um, a, a a thief who has this diamond mm-hmm. um, that, and he, the two of them kind of become friends because he gets them out of jail okay. and then they become thieves together. Bandits. Yeah. Gentlemen bandits. In oh, fact, well, uh, and one of the people that uh, Johnny Miller, uh, Miller's character knows is uh, Manchester mm-hmm. who knows everyone. Okay. Um, and he's just like, uh, at one point uh, he, he sees uh, Plunkett, the uh, McLean's, uh, you know, man, uh-huh. as he puts it, and he says, uh, he's like, "Oh, who's this? Uh, you know, who's this strapping uh, strong fellow?" And he's like, "Oh, this is my man. Uh, this is uh, Plunkett." Mm-hmm. And he's just like charmed. He's like, "I didn't think you swing that way." And he goes, "I swing always," Heck and yes. that is his character: is that he is he is in love with life and watching everything at all times. Mm-hmm. He knows who the villains are. He knows who the heroes are. Yeah, yeah, sure. He just doesn't care. Uh huh. He's he's in the middle, and he's just letting things fly where they are. And as things progress, he changes. Mm-hmm. It's a slow NPC change in the background that you notice this about him that he has care, and um, he's just a fabulous character. He's very mm-hmm. flamboyant. He's very out there. Um, and I wanted to see more of him. And so yeah. I'm like, I'm going to make stories that include him because I want to see more of him. Sure, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things for copying is is when you see something that you like and you want more of it. I know people who have stolen uh, Toph from or Toph from um, the Last Airbender. Toph Beifong. Yes, yes. Uh, because they love all the aspects of the depth of her character mm-hmm. and and how far it goes, and are just like, I want to see more of this part of her life, and so that's the character I'm playing. I'm I'm going to play the part. After the end of the movie, or not the, you know, the series. Yeah, 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 um, I gotcha. You know, where she's becoming this kind of sheriffy person now that she understands who she is. Or mm-hmm. I'm going to play her before she meets the airbender, where she's a child kind of sneaking out, doing whatever she wants. Yeah. The, but the, a rich child who... The the, the rich daughter of a, of, a, of a noble family who is sneaking out of the house to join an underground fighting ring. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And... It's it's that kind of um, it's that kind of pieces that I think are great for copy is when you're grabbing an aspect to to in, engage yourself as a bit of a storyteller to see where things go. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So uh, I I think I think probably the most important thing though, if you're like if you're going to steal a character whole media, um, is uh, don't expect that character's story to play out the same as the character in the media. Yes. Um, you know, if you're gonna play San Holo, oh lord, um, <laughs> I see where this is going. <laughs> you are in no way guaranteed to be hired by a wizard and his apprentice to rescue a princess from the castle of an evil warlock right. with your old cargo ship. Correct. Okay, Correct. it ain't gonna happen. Yeah. You know, uh, and and don't be disappointed when it doesn't. Right. You know, you're like, but but I'm but I'm playing Han Solo. I I know, but this isn't Star Wars, and yep. we're not just running the plot of the first movie here. Correct. Like, Correct. Calm down. This is my story. Yep. And exactly. You can be inspired by Han Solo. You can even take a lot of his affect and stuff like that. But like, we're going somewhere else. Yeah. With him. Yep. So figure out what Han Solo would do over there, and that's where we're going. Yep. Um. Now I want to talk about this. This this part of the conversation is a little bit near and dear to my heart. Oh, okay. So we're this go is now. this is typically where I start my character concepts. Okay, and that's with the flaws. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and I think this is a bit of a uh, uh, I don't say controversial, but it's a it's a bit of a bit of a debate with with a lot of people, and a lot of people have different ways of of doing this and navigating the the drawbacks mm-hmm. and the negative aspects of a character. Um, well, I'm going to flat out say at the beginning of all of this is that it helps you stop being a Mary Sue. Uh, it it does. Yes. It does. And I, so. I think, you know, that that's like everybody's kind of initial uh, first knee-jerk reaction is to, like, try to make it their idealized self. 
And not lose. And not lose. Not lose at any aspect. Right. 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 And they want to be able to do everything and they get frustrated when they can't and stuff like that. So throw a failing in there. (laughs) Right. You know, set yourself up for some failure. And Mm -hmm. I'm telling you this like explicitly. Please make a flawed character. Yes. Okay. There's that old that old saying, alcohol, because no good star story ever started with someone eating a salad. (laughs) Except for that cat. In the meme, where they're yelling at it. Yes. That's that's the only exception, I think, to that rule. Yes. <laughs> but there's still conflict there. There's still conflict. Because those women are angry <laughs> at that cat. cat. Maybe not the salad, but definitely that cat. Exactly. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I know I've, I've talked about this before, like, but, like, you know, making bad decisions, like, it, it, and it's fine. Like, mm-hmm. y- you as the player, I'm sure, and everyone else at the table are probably sitting there going, this is the most unwise decision you have ever made. But, like, it's not important that you know that. Mm-hmm. It's important that your character doesn't know that. Correct. You know? Uh, and, and, like, you can sit there and watch your characters make stupid decisions that get them into heaps of trouble because it's what the character would do. You right. know, and I know we we, we do kind of like rip on that, like, oh, it's what the character would do. But sometimes, yeah, it's what the character would do, especially if it's their flaw. Uh-huh. If it's something that gets them, in, if it is the one thing that gets them in trouble, you know, if it and, and some characters have very simple flaws, mm-hmm. you know, Garfield will eat all the lasagna. Yeah. If it's put in front of him, he will eat all His of the lasagna. It's gluttony. It, it's a thing. Yeah. Period. Simple as that. Mm-hmm. You know, there are the Seven Sea had star crossed. Yep. You were you are going to run across a problem that's going to turn you into wanting it in in a love sense. I, yeah, I I didn't have star crossed. Did I have star crossed? Uh, was that me, Hel- Helmut, yes. and uh, yes. uh, that uh, was one of your aspects. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We just didn't um, get to more than that because Helmut was the 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 point. Uh. So I I I'm the I'm the subject of of built in drawbacks. Um. Uh. Like fate, fate kind of has it. Um, in that you're going to write aspects as kind of your attributes for your character. Right. Um, and aspects are meant to be written in a way in which they can kind of be double-edged. Mm-hmm. In that you can use them in an advantageous way, but they can also be compelled in a negative sense. They're just a direction your character can be pulled. Sometimes that's a good direction that works for you. Sometimes it's a direction you don't want to go and you get pulled that way anyways. The power of the DM compels you. Yeah, The power of the DM compels you. Um, Savage Worlds (laughs) actually starts character creation with pick some hindrances. (laughs) Pick some. Not one. Pick some. Pick some. Here's three, basically three points worth of hindrances. Four. Oh, sorry. It's four. It is four four. points worth of hindrances. One big one, two little ones. You can pick up extra edges and extra attribute points off of that and stuff like that. Extra skill points. Mm -hmm. It's great. I mean, you get something for for your efforts, but the first thing they ask you to do is, okay, show us where the cracks in your character are. Yep. Um... 7C hubris. has hubris. Yep, hubris and virtues. Um, you know, and and again, nothing says you can't make up your own. Um, no, actually, just a few examples here. I you know? loved Bone Sunder's addiction to potions. That was one of my favorite things that you had that you kept bringing, and it was very, very, very much a D and D thing, mm-hmm. like so much a D and D thing that you're always going to have a, a pocket full of potions that you're getting from all kinds of stuff. Why not have an addiction to them? Oh yeah, absolutely. Like, and, even, and even when when uh, like the cleric in the group would would cast uh, you know buffs on him, um, yeah. He, he just loved that. Yeah. Because, I mean, what what's better than being a, a, a swole gladiatorial fighter? Being a swole gladiatorial fighter with giant strength yeah, cast on you, obviously. Yeah, There's yeah. no high like it. Nope, nope, nope. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I love that kind of stuff. I... It it's it is candy for DMs, but at the same time, it's more candy when you watch it just naturally occur. So it's not something you have to force. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, so, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you talked earlier about like the the, the fighter uh, self imposing paralysis on himself. Yes, because yeah. it's it's just part of his character. That's just yeah. Uh, the berserker one that I had as well, where the character kept flipping into berserk mode. Uh, and nobody knew what was going on. Yeah, yeah. A little poorly executed, but yeah. an interesting self-imposed drawback. The moment that he saw blood, he went berserk. Yep. And that's all it took. So, and, so like I said, the, the, the big thing about about these flaws and stuff like that is that they give your character interest. And they they get you into trouble and not avoiding it. Yes. Um, People are emotional creatures, and we don't always make the best choices. And so sometimes, even though the Unsealia Accords say that you cannot commit violence at this party yep. against your hosts, 
Sometimes you just gotta light their mansion on fire and and, and reap the whirlwind. And, and slowly walk out while still eating cake. <laughs> exactly. You just you rescue the girl, you kill the vampires, yep. and you, you burn the place down behind you, and a, a 10, 10 to 15 book war breaks out. Yep, because you're angry. And c- because, because you're angry. Yeah. Because you got a little bit of a temper and a little bit of pyromancy. Yep, yep. Um... Ah, so, right. so I want to say, and this is one of the things that always gets me is that, uh, early role players forget that your character is going to evolve. You've got, you've got to have a goal. Your character didn't just step into the bar saying, I want to drink without like having five days prior to that thought about maybe I do want to join the fighters guild. Or, yeah. Like w- what am I doing with my life? Like if your character has been running so hard at whatever they've been doing and they haven't had a moment to stop and think, maybe this is the game that they stop and think. Yeah. And they're yeah, like, absolutely. what am I doing with my life? That's a perfect evolution that can definitely happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so some, I will say that it's best to do that in your zero session. Oh yeah, or yeah, or before you dice hit the table, but there is nothing that says that your character doesn't get the ability to do that. Two, four, two, three, four games in, have a reality check. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I, I I love scenes in movies where people are pulling guns and one guy is like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! This is not what I checked it for. We were supposed to do this one way. Why are we all pulling firearms?" Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Whoa! <laughs> like, like that scene from the second Iron Man movie. Yeah. Like, look, look, I I don't even know the guy, and he cra- pays me a crappy wage anyway. <laughs> exactly. Like, okay, go. Yeah, he yeah. <laughs> just out, runs yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, and and that's the kind of thing that that you want to have is is you want to have a point where your character says "whoa" in their mind. Mm-hmm. And has it, or has, or has a light bulb moment, or has a passion that suddenly hits them, and that you make that, you write that down, you know what that passion is, you can come back to it, and evaluate it as you keep going. Yeah, because that helps you every session remind where you're headed, and what you've learned mm-hmm. along the way. So, yeah, no, I, I think, I mean, evolution's kind of the point. Yeah, is I mean, if if you're not, if this character is going to be interacting with a story and going on a journey and and being you know uh, interacting with and being interacted with uh, by all these other different characters and forces and stuff like that out there in the world, like if your character doesn't grow and change mm-hmm. along a, along a journey, what what are you doing? Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Um, I mean, are you writing in the story? Okay, but that doesn't give much role play, and that's not a character. That's that you're a witness. Yeah, yeah. Try not to yeah. be a witness is and what we're asking. Look, I mean, even even if your goal is just, um, you know, riches and glory. Right. That's that's fine. That's sure. That's a goal, and it's a good starter goal for people who aren't, you know, used to writing deeper, complex characters with, like, you know, four-page backstories. Right. And that's and that's good. But what are you going to do when you – just just answer this one question. What are you going to do when you get the riches and the glory? Why? Why are you getting the riches and the glory? Is it to bring home to mom? Well, and is I, it? I will counter that with, oh God, I don't know. And that's a wonderful point to be in the story. It's like, right. you just got the gold. You're now sitting, you know, across a long table from the king and the queen and the princess you just saved. And she's not coming home with you. She's going with the prince who was being saved for. Sure. And she's getting married and you're sitting there with a pile of gold and you go, was it the journey that was worth it or the gold? Maybe the real treasure was the friends I made along the way. Oh, God. You know, I think I'm just going to take enough for cab fare and some repairs. Yeah. And, you know, I'm good. Uh-huh. I'm good. You know, and and that's a story. Or you scoop up all the gold, you give the king the finger, and you walk out the door. You know? You that's a thing, up, too. You start an adventurous guild of your own. I don't know. Yeah. But, like, but wh- that what do you... pause is always great. But but I'm in it for the gold. Just ask, just ask yourself, Why? Yeah. And that will lead to a bunch of cool things right yeah. there. And you may not have the answer right away, and that's fine. Mm-hmm. Maybe maybe the journey is finding that answer. Yeah. I revenge stories always have that. Uh-huh. You know, is that halfway through the revenge story you get the question asked by another team member or somebody else, like, What are you gonna do when he's dead? Mm-hmm. What are you gonna do? Are you just gonna sit there over his body and gloat? And you're like Is that gonna make everything go away? I don't know, I'll have to find out when I get there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. you you show up at it at his place, guns blazing, with a therapist with you. Who's he? He's my therapist. Why? Because when I'm done with you, I'm gonna need him. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Yeah. Uh, so now the other the other thing I kind of want to bring up with the with the the evolution of characters is uh, the the cut. Co- mm, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, the concept that uh, no character survives contact with the story. Oh God, yeah. Uh, no, that is so true. Now, what what I mean by this is, you sit down and you write a character concept of like, uh, well, for for instance, um, I made uh, a character concept for Sean's game. Um, mm-hmm was a cleric of Helm by the name of Kira. Mm-hmm. And uh, Kira was going to be this, like, exuberant, bubbly, cheerful, even when things, the chips are completely down, just this, like, come on, guys, look on the bright side, sort yep. of just a Disney princess. Sure. You know, absolute core Disney princess. But, like, when we got into the game, I kind of found that the, the, the dynamic I thought I was going to have wasn't there. And the other two players at the table were newer. And this was with Knox and uh, uh, and his friend Sarah. Um, and uh, they were, since they were newer to the game, mm-hmm. they didn't really have the impetus to drive the plot. If you know what I mean? Right. Um, there was, there was kind of, a, okay, what do you guys want to do? And since they were newer players, I, I wanted to leave that answer up to them. Mm-hmm. But the, the, you know, not not really having a good footing for how to do the D and D thing, the answer was just kind of like, I don't know, what what can we do? And gotcha. so, instead of being like the supporting Disney princess, I ended up being the zealot with some motivation, who was like, <laughs> okay. all right, all right, fam, there's dangerous people out there. They're gonna hurt the people we love. I follow the god of protection, and I want to protect them by right. killing those guys over there. Yeah. What do you say? Is this is this a good plan? I'm checking with you because I want to make sure the group has the group is all together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. Let's go kill people. All right. Yep. That's what I like to hear. Let's kill people. Um, and yeah, we went from there. Uh, so she 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 was still definitely cheerful and upbeat, but not to like Disney level Disney princess levels. Mm-hmm. And she kind of became this like militant priestess like cheerleader for the for the group instead. You know. What she looked like on paper in session zero is not at all what hit the table in session one. Yeah. Okay. I okay. interacted with the story and Kira skewed hard to the side. Yeah. Yeah. I've I've had characters like that. I had an idea. I remember one of my first character concepts was a glass walker in uh, Werewolf uh, and basically a, a tech nerd. And the idea was is that he was just coming into his own and understanding what he was and like why he could become like, like why he was so good at technology, why it became natural to him. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and it was because of his werewolf aspect and, uh, and, and how he connected with it. And I wanted him to be um, fearful of it and mm-hmm. kind of questioning. And instead, uh, <laughs> as I, as the, as I came in contact with the story and d- discovered that there were basically mages messing with things and we had, this whole faction trying to screw with stuff, he became more and more militant. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, at, yeah. at what he was doing and like, and, and controlling. And he wanted to like, no, we need to stop this crap right here and right now. Like we can't let this go forward. Um, from what I know, this is nothing. None of this is going to work out. And the rest of you guys are just babies with swords. Like you don't understand the implications of the future after all, they're all dead and their plan goes through kind of a thing, mm-hmm. you know? And that's, that's kind of where it was going. I was like, wow, he, he's not very fearful. <laughs> that's, no, that's, that's not going to work. Not at all. That's yeah. going to work. So, yeah. Uh, all right. Some some tropes to avoid. Well, not tropes, but some uh, some pitfalls to avoid when, when uh, creating character concept. Okay. Give me one. Uh, all right. So, I see leaning on your source your source material too much. I agree. Um, so, I mean, deriving your character from the motivations of your inspiration rather than making uh, decisions based on your character. Yeah, I, I, I could see someone very easily taking, like, The Witcher yeah, and saying, yeah. this is exactly how he reacts to situations, so I'm going to react that way. And he's a loner for the most part. Yeah. Like, he's, he's not going to work with a group of people as far as his stories go, and that makes him very challenging to work with. Um, So if you're just being him every time, you're not 
you're 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 playing by you you're, you're reading from a card <laughs> yeah, kind yeah, of basically. a thing. I mean you're 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 look you, the thing you need to understand is you're not you're not Geralt of Rivia. Your Correct. character may be based on Geralt, but you are not Geralt. Right. Your and your circumstances not... are not the same. Correct. Your motivations are not the same. Yep. Your story is not the same. Correct. You cannot make the same decisions. Yep, exactly. You know? Um and that kind of goes along with not doing things that fit into the story, the 13th Warrior Hobbit thing. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love what you put in here, and I'm going to say it. The lone, the lone wolf pack of one brooding secretive edge lords. Yes. Like, <laughs> like, that is fantastic. He's a powder keg balanced on a knife's edge. Yes. He's a barrel full of loose cannons. <laughs> it's, it's terrible, and you're still saying what? Yes. Yeah, keep saying what. Uh, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's so true that people tend to create these um characters who are kind of just a void in the story they're not part of the story yeah exactly like um and i i, I kind of made the mistake of playing one of these in the past okay. um and the the mistake i made was that i was fully willing to talk about my character's backstory and explain to anyone who asked why my character was such an absolute jerk Yes. Um, but I was the silent brooding jerk. And nobody wanted to ask you anything. And nobody wanted to talk to me. Yeah. And so there was just like, I was, there were, they were getting, the, 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 the storyteller was getting complaints. Yeah. Why are you allowing this character that is a brooding jerk? And I'm like, literally, just like, if anybody is like, dude, what's up? Yeah. I would spill half my backstory and they would understand. I'm not holding anything back, but no one has approached me. And so... After I, I heard that my character was getting some complaints, I, I did a scene where my character, um, was a, a male character, strips off his shirt, and everybody can see all the whip scars all over his back. And I described it like looking like hamburger meat that had scar tissue pulled over it. Yeah. And everybody was like, why are you such a... Oh. Oh. Yeah. There's only one place you can scar, whip scars like that, and that's slave pits mm -hmm. in the mines and like... Yeah. Oh, now I understand why you really badly want to just murder face every single one of the bad guys because you used to be with them, didn't you? Yep. Yes, I did. And I escaped. And now I will have my revenge. And that is why I have cast my lot in with you. Mm -hmm. And I will not stop until the blood is done flowing. Mm -hmm. and they're like, okay, you're a little intense, but I like where your spirit's at, you know? <laughs> And then, like everybody else, you was got kind Moxie. Of, yeah, everybody else is just like, oh wow, okay. Well, we got to treat this character with a little bit of, like, a little more respect. I think, like, yeah, kind of. We kind of get it now, you know. But it took me leaning into that because I was playing the secretive edge lord character, you know. Um, and up until that point, my my backstory never came into it. My yeah. brooding never came into it. Uh, I didn't say anything during conversation, so I never added anything other yep. than a scowl. See, and that's the thing is, is that I would say if you're going to play a character that is kind of leaning into that, don't lean so far that you're not interacting. Yes. Give yes. yourself things to interact. Um, a good example of this, um, if you get a chance, if you want to, if you want to see a good Edge Lord character, mm -hmm. um, watch uh, Disney's Three Musketeers. Okay. If you want to watch a good Edge Lord, pull out a Disney film. It sounds funny. Yeah. Uh, but. You have a character who lost his wife, who lied to him, who then, you know, who basically then gets, according, is, is put in prison. So he goes silent. Is this Aramis? Athos. Athos, yeah. So he is an edgelord. Mm -hmm. He drinks. He's silent. But the one thing that keeps endearing him in the story and gems him back to the group is that he's, he's playfully aggressive. Mm-hmm. So it keeps him interacting with the others. Yeah. He's always there when they need him to drink and to hang out and do what's what's necessary. But he he when anything gets close to him, he steps away from it. Yeah. And that's the one I mean, he's definitely an edgelord without a doubt, mm -hmm. edgelordy as can be. And it's it's the other characters learn about his past and mm -hmm. know aspects of his past. So that's another thing you can have is that um you can do a pass out of secrets to help your story get carried through another player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
you know, is you can give the DM rights to pass out secrets. This is one of the reasons why I loved interludes in, yes. uh, in Savage Worlds. Because yep. it's like, look, I just need you to tell a story about your character. I don't need you to tell a story. It doesn't need to be two of the other characters. Mm-hmm. Just tell me what happened when you were alone, mm-hmm. you know, right? Uh, this, this this past week. Yeah. What, did, what were you meditating about? Right. Well, my character's really struggling with this, you know, blah, blah, blah. Now, at least, at least the players yep. know... Oh, this character's struggling with some stuff. I kind of, I kind of see their motivations. We though. can see the deepness of the character. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, for, the for, for me, honestly, my favorite edge lord, edge lord character off the top of my uh, top of my uh, uh, my head is uh, Jane from Firefly. No, that's a great one too. Because uh, he's he's roguish. He's got questionable loyalties. He's excessively violent. Constantly needs to be reined back in. Heck, in one episode, Mel almost vents him out the airlock because he basically betrays the group. Um, but when the chips are down, those guns come out, but they always come out for the group. Yes, you know that is that and is when, true. And when the group says, "All right, we're going to do this," he's going to bitch about it mm-hmm. constantly. But he's going to go with them. Yep. You know. And during it, he's still going to keep bitching. Oh, he's going to keep bitching the entire time. That's yeah. the charm of his character. Right. You know, it's what's what makes him an edge lord. Is he's yep. so disagreeable? Yes. But... Yes. Which kind of brings us around to, <sighs> don't be a one note or a one trick character. Yeah. This this can this can backfire hard. So like, if you are the 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 comic relief. That's that's one thing and can sometimes go too far. But on the other hand, if like your character is exceptionally interested in motorcycles mm-hmm. and you're going to look and talk about any motorcycle that you see or whether or not you can work on it. And you're going to weasel that into any conversation because that's your big thing. That's your quirk. You love motorcycles. Right. It's not at that point. And the big bad evil guy rides in on a motorcycle. And instead of saying, oh, crap, here comes the big bad evil guy. What are we going to do? You say, he drove in on a motorcycle? What kind of motorcycle? And you want to have a 15-minute conversation about that. Especially with them. Yeah. And that, like, there's a point at which it gets to be too much. and But there's a point where you're like, the you know, the bad guy rolls in on a motorcycle. What is it? Uh... I don't know. It's it's a big chopper, very expensive, uh, lots of upgrades it's, on it. It's a Harley. It's su- super compatible. customized. It's a Harley compatible. So, but super customized, yeah. very expensive. I lean over to the fighter. He's got a lot of money. That's a Harley. It's a Super Ed 220. Thing's got 440s underneath it, double wheels, super axle. I, I, I think he means business. Mm-hmm. But you know what? Go kick it over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, one, one dent in that thing drops the price by fifty thousand credits. <laughs> that, that that that's valuable input. Boom. And you didn't detract fifteen minutes of gameplay. That's right. It, you know. Uh. So yeah, just 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 be careful. Like it's good to give your character quirks, but don't make your quirks the only thing your character does. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Engage with the story. Try to try to be a real person with real reactions. Uh. And and just go from there. So. Uh, all right, you want to do the? You want to do this character building exercise? I know we're, we're like we're we're literally over time already. I want to be over time on this one. Though. All right, man, let's do this. I want to do this. Okay, do you want to do the questions or do you want to do the concept first? So your setting is okay. <laughs> your setting is um, <clears throat> it is. We've not discussed this. I have no idea what she's about to drop. Uh, me. Victorian turn of the century, sort of, uh, sort of times. Okay. okay, Victorian turn of the century. Got it. Uh, so think think more of a steampunk aesthetic. Oh, we're okay. not we're not leaning hard steampunk here. Okay, so um, light. Uh, the world magic exists in the world, okay. or has until very recently. Magic has disappeared. Oh, okay. Um, and so. Uh, your benefactor, your rich, noble benefactor, okay. has gathered a group together to help him discover what happened to magic and what can be done to bring it back. Okay. Um, and so I need an adventurer from you uh, that fits in that setting, please, that would do the bidding, but either for pay or for prestige or whatever your reasons, of a rich, noble benefactor. Okay. Um, I have two. Okay. That immediately came to mind. Sure. Uh, just recently, I've been listening to a couple songs that came up from uh, in the steampunk circles, uh, and I immediately thought of a uh, female vocalist. Okay. Like a, a singer. Okay. Um, like a canary kind of character who uh, has been making her way as a as a more of a starlet. Making her way. 
uh, but also has aspects uh, of her past that, uh, because she's a socialite, because she she can sing and do all of these things, uh, she can manipulate herself into a lot of situations. So she tends to kind of be a spy uh, at things. Uh, but her drive has been and is is always um, about uh, her image mm-hmm. okay. in, in others. Um, she's never been one who can accept that she is forgotten. She will never be forgotten. Okay. Um, whether it's her voice that people think songs that she sang better and people saying her version was better, um, or just the, the, a memory of one night of her singing on a train in front of a group of like 16 people in a quiet, you know, uh, steam car, uh, with, you know, a voice modulation even, even to it where she can, uh, she can entrance that group for an hour okay. that they'll never forget it. That's, that's her motivation. So uh, what, 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 what brings her to the group then? Like that it's the, the promise of, of fame the promise that by of fame. doing, okay. by doing this for a rich benefactor, she is going to be seen and known. I got you. Okay. Okay. She'll so be connected. So she's not, she doesn't really even care about the disappearance of magic nearly as much as, Oh, rich benefactor wants something. Yep. I'm going to step right up. I can steal a little bit of the limelight. That's right. Okay. I know people. I can step into the situation. All You're right. going to need somebody with a face. All right. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. So. All right. You want to you wanna go for me? All right. <clears throat> Setting. Uh, space. Okay. Um, a distant galactic style future. Um, mining of uh, asteroids and of... Uh, um, exoplanets is is something that happens a lot sure okay uh in this uh galaxy um there are a number of systems that are relatively easy to accept you know to get around in Mm -hmm. Uh, jump points are pretty much standard uh and the problem is is that resources become the issue so now they're pushing they've been pushing to further and further our setting is mm-hmm. a particularly well mined out exoplanet, literally to the core. It looks like Swiss cheese, but the entire place is a home. Oh, okay. 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 Um, a lot of it is old miners who basically built their homes there and sure. haven't been kicked out because, well, there's still space because it's a full exoplanet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not huge, you know, but but New York sized in in square footage sure uh maybe Manhattan mm-hmm. um is is the livable space okay, okay. um and uh it is owned whole cloth the exoplanet is owned whole cloth by a single corporation sure uh but that corporation had you know all kinds of contractors that did the work whether they were doing security whether they were doing mining whether they were doing anything and they're leaving the corporation doesn't need the exoplanet anymore there's there's little to no resources there. They're pulling out. They're okay. pulling out gotcha. uh, of the thing. And so there's a uh, there's a, a, a rich enough group there, a, a if you will, a cartel. Uh-huh. Uh, and that leader of that cartel who's been basically managing quietly behind the scenes all of the players to keep to keep the peace at a certain level for themselves whether what you know getting security to do what they need to to allow the miners to live where they are and kind of just holding things have realized that they're losing their ground and it's time to move to the next one so they're they're planning a new group to step into the next exoplanet and make a space for them so they're looking for, they're they're sending out a bid for the opening team okay, so they okay. they're putting out a challenge and they're asking for people to join. Huh. If you can make it through this, we're going to send you to the new exoplanet and you're the beach party. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I mean, initially, like right off the bat, I am 100% thinking of the expanse. Okay. Uh, so I'm kind of fishing through there. Um, a lot of what you said. Uh, so gritty sci-fi. Yeah. Brings up a lot of what you said brings up, um, especially like, you know, the, the, the company abandoning this exoplanet, this exoplanet has already been cored out of all yeah. its resources. It's essentially a dead Swiss cheese planet mm-hmm. with just people living in the holes left. Yeah. Um, holes they made. It's, a, that, that paints a very desolate picture for me. Yeah. Um, and with the sort of gritty minor sort of thing going on, uh, not only am I thinking of the expanse, but I'm specifically thinking of the belters. Yeah. Uh, that style okay. of sort of, um, Almost space tribal okay. uh, uh, existence of a mix of different cultures all banded together by the common um, 
the common existence of being a uh, a throwaway, you know, belt miner, mm-hmm. essentially. Um, and so I, I, I think my character would have to be um, born out of that sort of thing. So I, I see them being a little, a little gritty, a little tough as nails. Sure. You know. Um, Were you born on the exoplanet? Oh, definitely. Okay. Definitely. Um, I mean, I'm guessing it took... It could have taken hundreds of years to actually mine this thing out. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing generations have sprouted up and, and died on this on this particular exoplanet. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I see them I see them being there. Uh, they don't really know much else um, uh, as far as life outside of this goes. They've mm-hmm. heard stories, but it all seems kind of fantastical to them. Um, and so they're very much... They, they're... they're uh, They've accepted their reality that uh, this is, you know, they're they're just some backwater, you know, minor. So what's uh, their drive? What's their to, what's their today drive when they heard that this was going to be a thing? Well, this is this is a chance to kind of see the outside. Mm, um, OK, because, uh, you know, being being born in this society that's I mean, maybe this is the size of Manhattan. Sure. But like, imagine never having left Manhattan yeah. your entire life, you yeah. know, and then being told like, "Hey, you've got the chance to go somewhere else." I'm like, "What do you mean there? There's somewhere else?" <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know hypothetically there's somewhere else. It's like, like you get to leave Earth and go to the go to Mars. You're like, "What?" <laughs> right? Like Mars is Mars was an option. Like, right. oh, okay, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've read about it in storybooks, but to actually go there, you know, right. and see right. this sort of thing, it's it's kind of a chance to, you know, leave the. Uh, leave the neighborhood and see the see, mm-hmm. the, see the universe for once. Um, okay, and so I, I think I think that chance to kind of be something a little more than the stunted growth of roots that you know to get outside of the the, the small potted plant and see where see where my roots can spread. You know. Okay. Um. Uh, I mean, initially, I I, I think the, the character concept I like uh, is um, sort of a gun bunny. Okay. Um. I like the character who can who can apply a little bit of force, but maybe you know do it with restraint, you know sure. do it with do it with some sense and stuff like that. But I kind of like um, the idea of being a, being the muscle of the group, um, and uh, so maybe this this you say it looks almost like a mafia, like a crime organization. Yeah, it's 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 it, it, I, I, it's it's an underworld group, but they don't work for the corp. They, like they have their like they're in between all the layers. Sure, they're, sure. And I almost had the. Uh, I almost had the thought of calling them the interstitial. Okay. Because they're between the decks. They work between the layers. All right, all right. Fair enough, fair enough. But that's where everything works. Uh, So I I see them selecting me because uh, uh, they know that if someone needs to put pressure, that I can put that pressure without thinking about it, but that I will show restraint when restraint is needed. I know the correct application of pressure. So I'm going to ask you one question uh-huh. that's going to direct my story. Go. Why can you be trusted? <sighs> All right. So that's an excellent question I didn't think of until now. Yeah. Um, so we're going to say that my father was a high-ranking official in this uh, in this organization. Um, maybe my, my father was someone who was like, uh, and I don't say like he's the leader of it or anything like that, but like he's at least mid to high level and respected enough. Okay. Um, and that's kind of how I got into doing some of this stuff too. Sure. Because you don't just, you don't just like become the gun bunny because you felt like it, you know? Right. Okay. I got to have some ties to the underworld, I guess. Some ties to probably some criminal organizations and sure. stuff like that. Um, I'm certainly not military. There's no right. government there. Right. There's security force there. And, but... and, and the company ran off. So the only security is essentially what we apply. Right. And that would be me. Okay. Okay. Um, and so they're like, okay, well, you know what? You're, we know your dad and you've got a good enough track record. So, you know, your, your, your dad put in a good word for you. Let's, let's get you in there. A, okay. little, a little, a little, a little space age nepotism. Okay. Okay. A little space age nepotism. All right. I do have the skills. You got the skills. But still the nepotism. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Yep. Okay. I like it. I like it. So I I think yeah, I I like your concept. I, I 
I think it's funny that we can do this on the fly like uh-huh. this. But at the same time, like our brains were pre-primed with all the previous stuff that we just did. Well, no, no, no. But but at least, you know, I, I think it was very valuable to do this on the air so people yeah. could listen to it and kind of hear like, yep. okay, like initially I'm immediately thinking of The Expanse. Like that's where my inspiration yeah. is coming from. You the know? First, the, when you told me that it was 1900s slightly steampunk. I meant my my brain immediately went to like postmodern jukebox. So I'm I'm rolling the decks in my head of music, yep. Yep. and all I'm hearing is females, like a female vocal and female drive and female interest. And I'm like, okay, I'm playing a female. All right, I got that. I'm playing a female, uh-huh. and it's it's going to be a vocalist at that. Like, yeah. I'm I'm going to sidestep the entire thing. I'm going to go with a face style character, and I'm going to go in that direction. Um, and so. That's really where where everything starts to spin from is, okay, she's a face, she's in this time, she's avoiding the truth of, and reality of things because she works outside the system. Yep. She doesn't need magic. She has magic. She is magic. Mm-hmm. So why does she need more? Right. On. You know, kind of a thing. Uh, and I think that's that's kind of where that drive comes from in my mind frame is oftentimes... I will take one or two words out of the setting and mm-hmm. l- let them resonate as they come into me. Yep. yep. So absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. So. All right. Uh, we have a couple questions to get to. Sure. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna run real long tonight. Um, all That's right. Fine. So Knox in the box asks: uh, Are there any character concepts you find challenging or irritating to a DM? <laughs> uh, is there one that completely blindsided you? Is there a trope you're tired of seeing? Or think could be improved. Uh, I'm interested in learning your reasons. My goal is not to shame, however. Understood. Understood. Character concept I find challenging or irritating. Um, A long time ago, but go ahead if you've got one. I I, I got got one that just absolutely boils my blood every time I see it. What grinds your gears? The crazy character. (laughs) Fair enough. Um, anytime a character tells me that they are suffering from some sort of a derangement or they are mentally unwell in any way, uh, I, I instantly just scrunge. I cringe. I just, I can't. We have a character in my current group that is pulling it off. No, really well. Very He's well. absolutely pulling it off. So I want to clarify, I am not talking about you, Steve. <laughs> But I do want you to know that because everybody else who has abused me with that in the past, yep. when you were like, my character has a derangement, I was like, mm. but you're pulling it off. You're okay. You're allowed. But everybody else uh, who grew up in the late 2000s and thinks that, oh my God, so random. I like penguins and thinks that my character believes they're a sentient glass of orange juice is their character concept. That's not. I, I, oh, I can't stand it. Can't stand it. I think the only one that truly grinds my gears as a storyteller um, is that I I don't like silent blades. I've always had a hard time as a storyteller working with that, with the Snake Eyes character. I don't speak. I only react to things. And I, I, will, I will nod and I will gesture. Um, you know, I might leave notes. But mm-hmm. I I don't speak, and I'm I'm a silent killer. You do realize we sit around a table and talk, right? <laughs> you do realize this is a vocal medium, right? Like, like like Snake Eyes is great in a visual medium, yeah. You know, to a degree, to a degree. You know, it's cool to watch silent silent assassin movies that are Kurosawa. That's great. Mm-hmm. But when I'm sitting at a table and I'm and you're all asking for what we're gonna do and people look at your character and you just silently nod at the table and people are like what is, what does that mean? Right, right. You know, and then you get frustrated when you have to explain. Please, please don't do that. Mm-hmm. Please don't do that. Yeah. Please don't do that. Yeah. Like my wife played a strong silent character, and I want to say within t- two episodes she realized that her words when she does say them are important, mm-hmm. and she takes her time for that, and I think that's better. Yeah. Like I, I think characters who frame their words carefully are very different. Oh, absolutely, but, absolutely. Yeah, but, I think that but, one. Gets but me. use your words, though, yeah. You know, and I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad that we saw that change. Yeah. Is there? You're, a you're talking about Karu, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um. But I would say, um, is there any tropes? Is there one that completely blindsided me? Um. <sighs> Character concept that completely blindsided me. I. 
I think the character concept that completely blindsided me personally is, at least in recent memory, is uh, uh, Sean's character Thalian. Mm, okay. Um, because on the surface, he looks like he's this complete, just 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 like an asshole drunkard noble. <laughs> <laughs> playboy uh playboy, playboy noble yep. yeah millionaire playboy philanthropist whatever yeah um which he pulls off exceptionally well which which he really does but like in talking with him and i don't know how much of this has actually come out in game i don't know how much you guys as the players understand thalian's true motivations and stuff like well that. our characters don't but our player but the, i think the players are catching up with the fact that he's a fraud well well no 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 to I'm, I'm literally talking the exact opposite of that oh i know what his end goals are we've okay. had discussions about what thalian truly wants out of life right, and out of right. the world and that's that's the thing that kind of blindsided me oh, was okay. like he does play himself off as just a fool a drunkard an mm-hmm. asshole and you know who just throws his nobility around to get free wine out of people <laughs> and he's not okay that man is a hero oh lord or at least he's trying to be. Right. And we actually had a really great talk about his character concept last night. And I think, um, like, in the long run, it's going to end up being that, like, he has such good intentions, but he makes such bad choices to get there. Okay. Is going to be the, his, like, the theme of his story. Fair enough. Is can you, what's what's the quote that I love? Doth lie beget truth, doth verity, but wear the mask of falsehood. Ooh. Can you ever start with something impure and reach a pure goal? Fair enough. And that that's, I think, the theme of Thalian Arrowway. Okay, okay. And right. I did not expect that much depth no. out of that damn character. No, no. <laughs> All right. So Overwatch asks, what is a character concept you had in one of your games that you thought would work well but didn't? Conversely... Is there one that you thought wouldn't work well, but actually did? Uh, no, all my characters are damn masterpieces. Next question. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, I mean, character concept didn't work well. I'm not... Yeah, I'm trying to think of... I'm not saying that anything didn't work well, but like... I've definitely had character concepts that didn't last two sessions before I had to be something else because it didn't fit into the story with how everybody else was playing. Yeah. I think that's been more the case than it wasn't that my concept failed. It was that I couldn't maintain my concept and maintain playing in the game with the the other group members. Right. It was was either you change your concept or my character leaves. Kind of, kind of. Um, Yeah. I just, uh, I think that's been more of the case than anything else. Um, is there anything that I thought that wouldn't work out but actually did? Honestly, I did not think that Roderick would work out. Oh, yeah? Okay. I did not think, I, it was a total gamble, and I figured, I am probably never going to play with these people again. Mm-hmm. And literally, after the first session, they are all like, dear God, please stay with our game. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, I couldn't, because the timing. Um, so that's the only thing that didn't work out, was that I played a couple sessions with it, but I loved that character, but I did not think it was going to work out. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know, um... I I don't know if it was I don't know if it was my doubt in the character or if it was my doubt in this in in, in my my unfamiliarity with uh, Seventh C, hmm. uh, but I had my doubts about Don Angelo. Okay. Um, okay. I wasn't sure how a like I felt like everybody else in that group had like a sword style and like a really cool thing they did or like magic or something like that, and then Don Angelo was just like I drink wine and read poetry. Yes. Uh, and I wasn't sure how that was going to work, but actually he had some really good moments. Uh, where, like, my maxed-out oratory skill came into play. Yes. And uh, I was just like, oh, you need someone to have room presence? I've got room presence. Let me uh, let me go spout some pretty words at them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, a toast <laughs> to yes. our gracious hosts. And everybody, like, all eyes are on me, and they're like, oh, thank God Don Angelo's here. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did have... Uh, my Urban Shadows character, and I was trying to look up his name. It was a ghost character that I mm-hmm, had. Mm-hmm. Um, and I loved the concept of him. I loved uh, where he was coming from, that he was the survive. He was he died in a family, um, in a house fire that burned down, that he lost his wife. It was very deep. And even with that game, we were... Um, 
we were connecting the story together, like mm-hmm. all the pieces, because of the way that um, City of Mist works, um, or sorry, Urban Shadows works. But in the end, it like I struggled to keep connecting with the rest of the players because they were all playing very dynamic, mm-hmm. magical characters, and my character was very fatherly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and 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 driven. Uh, to uh, for protection, and they were all kind of wild guns, mm-hmm. and so it 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 didn't feel like it meshed as well as I wanted it to with with the story. So I think that was probably my one. Okay, okay. Uh, Knox actually had a really uh, kind of a cool follow up comment. He says, I, "I feel like you'd have more NPCs uh, that the concept failed for." Yes. Oh God, yes. Uh, so many. <laughs> So many more. But here's the thing, and my, my answer was yes and no. Um, because the, the 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 good thing about if your character concept doesn't work as an NPC, mm-hmm. is just change the NPC. Yeah, that that's the like, beauty of it. Honestly, that. players players are gonna be just so, so distracted by like other parts of the story and stuff like that. And, the, and and each individual NPC is a small enough part that you can make adjustments on them if they're gonna be if they're even gonna be recurring. Most of the time, like, your NPCs that your character concepts may or may not work for are like, yeah, you run into, like, this one person in this one town, and they say this to you, and you're like, okay, that was a weird character. And then they just move on, mm-hmm. you know? So there's – it's it's not like it's not like they're in an ongoing campaign that, you know, that character concept is going to be continuously tested against. NPCs are like Kleenex, you know? You can just kind of, like, toss them out after you're done with them and grab a new one. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's not as yes in quantity, but no in impact. Agreed. 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 So all right, what's all right. next week? All right, so uh, next week we are going to be discussing uh, what I like, and I don't know if this is the proper name for the uh, for the trope or not, but uh, it's what I'm calling it anyways. Is the hero contrivance? Oh yes, okay. yes. You want to say that? I had to have you explain it to me. Uh, so this is the idea that uh, the the world is on pause until the heroes come and interact with mm-hmm. it. Like uh, specifically, if you if you played the, the the Elder Scrolls Skyrim. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, you have um, Delphine, I think her name is, like, urgently telling you, like, the dragons are coming. We need to go now. They are burning the... towns down. Well, and isn't you're there, like... like, a war that happens? Yeah, yeah. there's, like, a war. That... I mean, there's, there's a bunch of stuff going on that is Pardon me. urgently needs your attention because the fate of Skyrim, nay, the fate of all Tamriel, nay, the fate of Nern itself hangs in the balance and you alone can solve this problem you know i I got this thing that tells me about this cave where if i can knock on the door just the right way they'll let me in and it's like a thieves guild i'm, I'm gonna go check that out okay right but as soon as you're done come back because it's urgent you got it three months worth of literally right. in-game I time i built a house next to a lake got i married. adopted a couple kids <laughs> got married like did a lot of fishing the ceremony was beautiful like mm-hmm. you know you'd be great like Oh, I delved into everything along the the the, the Draw Mountains. Yep. There, that's all cleared out on my map. Did you say something about urgent dragons? You must come now. Oh, right. I'm on my way. <laughs> that's the hero contrivance. <laughs> that the world in the, all of the plot, the world doesn't move unless the heroes are there for it. And the idea that like the king has a standing military and can't solve his own problems, he has he needs you to do it. So we're going to be talking a little bit about about, about, about the life of a hero uh, and how that falls into a story. Anyways, you can find us on Twitter at ST underscore Conclave, on Instagram at ST underscore Conclave. Listen to us live every Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Eastern time on MixLR.com slash Storyteller dash Conclave. And join us up, uh, join our discussion up on the Discord. Uh, you can find the link to our Discord in uh, on our Twitter as well as our website, StorytellerConclave.com. We'd also like to thank our Patreon named members, Knox in the Box, Sam, the Arcane Asylum, Sparkle Motion, Veteran, and Hulavu. You guys all help us make sure that this happens week after week. And we'd like to have more of you join so we can keep doing more of this. Um, our pre-show music is by Arcane Anthems. You can find that at Patreon.com slash Arcane Anthems. Our intro music, uh, Beyond the Warriors, is by Geefrog. You can find that at Geefrog.com or on Google Music. Our outro music, which you're hearing now, is 
is Only Our Footprints in the Sand by Midair Machine. You can find that at freemusicarchive.org. And as, uh, as always, a big shout out to our families, Vicky and Sean. Thank you so much thank for you. loving thank and you. supporting us. All of our friends who've sat with, us, sat with us at our tables over the years give us these great stories and character concepts to share with you. <laughs> Very much so. And uh, you, every single one of our listeners, we love you so much. Thank you. We love you. Good night. Good night.